Okay, today is Friday, March 24th. Uh, the time on our clock is uh, 10 16. I will call the Committee on Environment, Crime, and Legacy to order. Today agenda, uh, we have uh, eight items. We're going to switch around a little bit. Um, and the first testimony here, most of the bill are, are layover, so um, we may not need to vote, but there's two that we will need to vote for. Uh, I would like to call uh, Senator Howe first, he's online, to present Senate File 136. Senator Howe, are you online? You have to turn on your camera. Senator House uh, bill should, should go very, very fast. It's not controversial. It's a um, bill that passed uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, we just need to make change on the ex extension, make change on the deadline to extend it a little further so they can uh, have the money to use next year. Okay. okay. So Senator Howe, um, Anytime you're ready, but state your name for the record, and when you testify, right, come on. On here now. Ask him to state his name for the okay record. Stay in here? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. I'm just doing some email. <laughs> Welcome, Senator Howe. You hear, you hear us? Senator, how you have to unmute yourself. Can we unmute him from here? I did. I texted him. I texted him. Oh, okay. okay. all right. <laughs> Senator Howe, are you ready to present? Thank you, Mr. Chair, yes. Anytime when you're ready. Well, thank you. So, Senate File 136, members, is a, and I greatly appreciate it, by the way, uh, uh, Chair Her, uh, for hearing the bill today. Senate File 136 is actually, doesn't cost anything. Uh, what it does is extend the time that the Stearns uh, coalition of Lake Association can use this grant money that they receive to combat uh, flowering rush in uh, the uh, Sauk River watershed district. So basically what happened is because of some drought and because of some repair that had to be done on the Melrose Dam, they lowered the water level and they could not get in to do all the work they needed to do. And so what we're asking for in Senate File 136 is just to extend it from the deadline of June 30th of 2023 and extend it for a year to June 30th, 2024 to allow them to get the work done that needs to be done. And with that, Mr. Chair, I've got uh, bad, Brad Machucha from the uh, Stearns Coalition of Lake Associations that uh, bring some more clear uh, uh, itemization on what needs to happen. So if you could uh, uh, go to my testifier, I'd greatly appreciate it, Mr. Chair. Okay, uh, Mr. Matuska, please turn on your camera and state your name for the record. Welcome. Greetings, Thank thanks for having me. My name is Brad Matuska with the Stearns Coalition of Lake Associations. Go ahead with your presentation. So thank you, Senator Howe, and thank you for having uh, me here today. And just to echo what Senator Howe had just requested, we're doing a project in which we're trying to eliminate an aquatic invasive species that's coming downriver from Sock Lake. And we were able to survey it 
and we know where it is but due to unforeseen low water conditions we were unable to treat it last year so we are requesting to have that the money that's designated to finish this project just extended until June 30th of 2024. Thank you. Any questions from members to Mr. Matuska or Senator Howe? Oh, yeah. Senator Howe, I just want to see, I have a question for you. How much was the original amount? $50,000. Okay. And that's that same amount still there, right? Not used. I believe some of it may have been used, but uh, uh, I, but not all of it. So there's a portion of the fifty thousand dollars that is still there. Okay. Yes, Senator Hoffman. So does it, Mr. Chair? Thank you. That fifty thousand dollars is that coming out of your bucket this year, or is it left over? Did did it get snatched up in the general fund, the council? No. It. Senator Howe. Mr. Chair, mm -hmm. thank you. Uh, the money, some that money is still there, and it doesn't expire until June 30th, 2023. So it doesn't cost anything. All we're doing is extending the time for them to use the money, because otherwise it will go back to the general fund after June 30th, 2023. So we're asking to have that extended to June 30th, 2024, to allow them to do the work this year and get the project done. And just but the be, money doesn't come out of this year's budget. Okay. And just to be sure, we have fiscal analysts here. Mr. Mueller, can you reassure folks that it was the money will be there? Um, Mr. Chairman and members, there's a couple of different ways of doing it. Just because the money would otherwise cancel to the general fund, to extend it does have a cost. And I think the DNR said there's something like 40000 left. But there's ways of canceling it and reappropriating it that wouldn't have a cost. So I'll, I can work with um, the agency to figure out a way to best do this so that, they're, that we accomplish the goal of the bill and hopefully to do it in a way that does not have a cost. Sounds good. Any further discussion? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Senator, Senator Howell, closing remark? Mr. Chair, I, I greatly appreciate your attention to this bill. I, I do have a question what is the path forward? Uh, we could, I, I know we could just uh, lay it over for possible inclusion. Is there a way that we could uh, dual track it and pass it out of committee and hold it over for possible inclusion? Yeah, um, if we, if we uh, pass it without layover, it will go to the f finance committee. So if that's your, your preferred stop, we can certainly do that. You know, um, I think the, the simplest way will be to lay over. Well, Mr. Chair, I'd like to dual track it if that's possible. We can do that. Sure. Um, so we're saying to finance. But you okay with that, Senator Howell? I, I'm, I'm okay with that, Mr. Do, Chair. Do we have quorum right now? N Mr. Chair, no, you need, uh, well, we can just, you can just lay it, lay it over for, uh, inclusion and then bring it back up when you have quorum and just pass it out to to get it to dual track it for Senator Howe. Okay. Not All that right. I'm your committee administrator. I'm sorry. <laughs> she was oh, she, she knew the answer to oh, that right. and I just jumped on it. Sorry. Thank you, Senator Hoffman. <laughs> sorry. Okay, so we'll lay over and thank you, Senator Howe. We'll lay we will lay over Senator Fowl 136 for possible inclusion and the finance environment finance on of us. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, members. I greatly appreciate the attention to the matter. Thank you. Okay, next on the agenda here, I'd like to uh, call Mr. Bruce Corey first. Uh, Mr. Bruce Corey. Oh, Senator Sojewski. Oh, Bruce. Okay, you're right. Uh, Senator, um, yeah. If, if, if Mr. Dr. Bruce Corey can wait. Uh, Let's go ahead with uh, Senate File 2424, Senator Jasinski. Welcome to the table. And please introduce your name for the record. It won't be as hard to you as 
you are in transportation transportation committee. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Jasinski. Uh, appreciate you hearing this bill, uh, and yes, we'll talk. Uh, Senate file number 2024. First, I want to thank my uh, co-author, Senator Hoffman, uh, Senator Rasmussen, Senator Dreheim, and Senator Pa. Uh, this is a good bipartisan bill. I heard about this actually last session. Senator uh, Ingebrigtsen uh, brought this forward to me and talked about it and showed me some examples of what was going on. Obviously, in, in across the state, and especially in southern Minnesota, uh, many of our lakes become very green, and it, it really reduces the amount of tourism and things that happen in our and the use of our lakes. Uh, so when I got to uh, see the effects of what this uh, equipment does to our lakes, it, it's truly phenomenal to see what it can do to a lake. Uh, and I won't go into the details because my testifiers will, uh, but it, it really makes a, a lake go from green to clean. And it, it does it very uh, effectively. Uh, so what this bill does, it's $335,000. Uh, it it uh, does a pilot project for three lakes across Minnesota, some smaller, some larger, uh, different attributes to really see where this is effective and how we can use it across the state to really help our water quality uh, here in Minnesota. I think it will be a game changer uh, if it if it happens the way I saw it happen in a couple of lakes that, that we reviewed. Uh, so with that, uh, very excited to see this project go forward. Uh, I hope for your support. And with that, I have Mr. Dan Larson and Mr. Mark Hansen here uh, to go through. And I hope they have a video that we can show of, of what is done or the, the, the before and after. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it to my testifiers. And once again, thank you, Senator Herr, for hearing the bill. And I really do appreciate it. Thank you, Senator Jasinski. Uh, go ahead, uh, uh, Mr. Larson. State your name for the record. Mr. Chair and members, Dan Larson representing Water Quality 3D an innovative partnership that's bringing relief to frustrated local governments and lakeshore property owners who are annoyed and irritated at the, uh, with the green, stinky, algae-impaired waters in the lakes they love. With me, uh, uh, as mentioned, is Mark Hansen, a fellow Water Quality 3D partner. So we're excited to be able to introduce uh, to you a water treatment system we've developed that we think is a new tool for the state and the frustrating fight against filamentous algae and cyanobacteria, more commonly known as blue-green algae. That is such a problem for so many of our lakes each summer. So since 2017, we've self-funded the development of the system and we've targeted the smaller, shallower lakes in the, uh, in the, re uh, We've targeted the smaller, shallower lakes in the region that are highly influenced by nitrates and phosphates from ag runoff that feed the algae blooms. The success the lakeshore property owners and local governments are seeing is giving them hope that another option may be emerging to help them where no real viable option has existed before. So I'll echo Senator Jasinski in, in, in asking you to be sure and look in your testimonials uh, in your packets and each are asking your support for the three two-year pilot projects the bill would authorize and fund. There is universal displeasure with the limited and expensive solutions available to address the increasing number of algae-induced impairments that make lakes in this state unusable through most of the summer. As an example, one of the projects that, that, that this bill would fund, Lake Alice in the city of Fergus Falls, is at one mile in circumference and ringed by beautiful turn of the 20th century homes, those craftsman homes that are a focal point for the city and neighborhood, perfect for a picnic or an, an evening stroll around the lake. The, the trouble is the blue-green algae blooms at the end of each June make the lake repugnant from smell and force homeowners downwind to keep their windows closed. They've done extensive study on the lake and the options for relief included a $5 million drain and dredge proposal that wasn't practical for the city. For more than two decades, the state of Minnesota has conducted total maximum daily load sampling tests to determine if water bodies meet EPA approved water quality standards. And while thousands of water bodies have been documented to be impaired or exceed EPA water quality standards, seldom do any of these listed water bodies get restored and removed from the TMDL list. Traditional restoration efforts like land conservation, dredging, and chemical applications are expensive, invasive, and far too often temporary. 
There are few alternatives in any method. It needs to have testing to go along with it. Testing is a very expensive, is very expensive, especially for these smaller lakes. So project sponsors in this bill for, uh, for the lakes in, in this pilot project would have uh, funding to do targeted testing and more reasonably priced lake remedial, remediation alternatives. We have developed one of those methods, which includes extensive and remote testing. This provides critical and necessary information to the project sponsor to evaluate specific in-lake conditions and how they change with treatment. And uh, so the, the point of all this, uh, Mr. Chair and members, is that we, we, what we're doing here is, a, is showing an emerging technology that's getting at uh, a, a tricky and sticky situation for the state that's caused lake owners and local governments frustration over the years. So it's good for the recreational side of it. Fishermen like it, fish like it. So we've got a 13 second clip here if you want to see. This is our, our, uh, one of our uh, systems in operation and you can see w w what the minnows are attracted to. Thank you for the video clip. Um, <clears throat> let's go on to the next testifier, and then we'll open for question afterward. Uh, Mr. Hansen, if you can, are you? Thank speaking? you, Mr. Chair. Remember, okay. I don't have any prepared testimony. But okay, uh, just here for questions, Mr. Just Chair. Just here for question. questions. Okay. All right. Well, any any question from members? Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Dzinski. This is absolutely when you see some new innovation to get clean water. Everybody wants clean water, right? I mean. That's the, the whole conversation. Has this ever been, like yesterday, we had Dr. Peter Sorensen in here, and you know he was talking about his years of going after the invasive carp, and, and he finally, I mean, it, you know, it was kind of joy to see him say, I, you know, he finally has the answer, right? And it was great to see that, and it brought up a story of David Thomasoni and I when we went to see his, uh, his when he was first doing it, and he had chicken wire. He was trying all these different things, right? And and he said, well, the chicken wire, you got to get people in there and, and pull the, uh, uh, manually pull out the debris that gets in there. And Thomas Sony said, hey, I, I, I see there's a job creator. What do, you, what do you mean this is a barrier? It's not. But, but that LCCMR, these are the kinds of things, too, that, you know, if you're getting this pilot, how do you, I've, have you, do you know, has the LCCMR ever looked at how you're doing this kind of stuff? Is that something, too, that should have a broader appeal? I like this idea of let's start here, let's show what it can do, and let's expand it. So thanks for bringing this. Uh, thank you, Senator, or Mr. Chair, and yes. uh, thank you, uh, Senator Hoffman. Yes, I have just had some discussions with Senator Lang on the LCCMR. I uh, want to get this through and see what works, and then actually bring, go there as well to see what we can do in the future. Um, this is a pilot project. Someone asked me, well, why doesn't the Lake Association pay for it? Well, once it's proven, I think these Lake Associations will invest in it, but I think for them to go ahead without seeing the what, what can be done is the question. So once we see this it is a proven operation, and the thing I like about it, it's not chemical. This is just a, a, a mechanical thing that basically airifies, comes in, airifies, and then once it airifies, it continues on. As you well know, and they've uh, been down and, and taken some test samples from one of the lakes, and they see where the inflow comes from the farm fields, the phosphorus things comes in, and, and when they actually can airify that, it turns the whole lake over. And, and we had an example in Wasika that was, um, it was so green you could almost walk on the lake. And after using this uh, piece of equipment, it was, you could see the bottom probably six feet down. So it's truly amazing what can be done. So I think it's got a lot of potential here in Minnesota with the land of 10,000 lakes. So I'm really excited uh, to see if we can get this bill passed and uh, see if it as a pilot project. And I think it'll take off and we can work through the LCCMR on, on further implementation across the state. So again, thank you, Mr. Chair. I really do sure. appreciate this. Well, I'm eager to see this pilot uh, go through. You know, I, I, uh, there's a huge lake in my district, uh, Phelan Lake, and there's, uh, there's also a Phelan change of lakes, you know, from Lake uh, Coleman to Jarvis uh, to Keller, then Round Lake, then drop down to Lake Phelan. And I'm, I'm tempted to put, you know, to ask you to put that in the language itself just for pilot, but maybe I'll wait for a, yeah, maybe I wait for a different day, or maybe we could do, you know, we have could have a little discussion later to see if if one of the failing change of late is a possible for the pilot 
um, for the pilot project because certainly uh, when I walk around Lake Phelan, at, at early spring is, is fine, but once you get to midsummer, it's so the whole lake turned green. So you know uh, we want to make it pleasant to our um, our uh, uh, resident and people who like to catch fish out of the, out of Lake Phelan. So. Yeah, and so good. This is this is a good bill, and thank you for bringing forth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I'm sure that's your final remarks already. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Chair, yes. So uh, we'll lay Senate uh, file uh, 2424 for possible inclusion in the Environment uh, Finance Omnibus Bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, members. Yeah, thank you. Um, next will be Dr. Bruce Corey. And Dr. Bruce Gorey will talk about our global cultural destination and how that's relevant to the ethnic or cultural identity within the legacy dollars that are under this jurisdiction. And this is information hearing. Uh, there's no bill to vote. Uh, we're trying to by time, so um, we, by time, so that uh, our member will join and we'll have a place for quorum to pass a few coming up bill, including uh, Senator Shang's bill. So, Dr. Corey, anytime you're ready, but state your name for the record. Chair Senator Fong He and members of the committee, uh, my name is Dr. Bruce Corey. I am an economist, professor, and cultural entrepreneur. Entrepreneur. I'm also a board member of the Minnesota Museum of American Art where we are working with our new executive director whom you met the other day, Dr. Kate Bean, to paint a beautiful canvas of the vibrant colors that make up Minnesota's art. An artist in our collection, George Morrison, was recently had a US postal stamp in his honor. So thank you for allowing me the space and time during a very momentous day at the legislature. Uh, yesterday, uh, sitting at the back of the room, I saw ordinary people who were up here sharing their story, and thank you for allowing that space and accessibility to all. When the world sees Minnesota, they see the murder of an innocent man on the streets of Minneapolis and wonder what's going on. The strategy of cultural destination is to flip this historical experience by leveraging cultural assets of diverse people as both a community building as well as a wealth building strategy. You can see clear examples of this by the Capitol in the Little Mekong Night Market, in historic Rondo, or at Little Africa Fest. Uh, I know that you have a bill coming up uh, next, 1898, about preservation of, of language, and I wanted to share this example uh, of, of this uh, author, Kao Kalia Yang. Uh, and in the historic context of the Hmong in Minnesota, People wondered whether this new refugee community, com uh, community coming to Minnesota, uh, how would they deal with differences like language and, and uh, 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 jobs and, and, and life in general. And what she's done is taken the English language and made music out of it, literally. Uh, her book is the best-selling best book, but recently she uh, translated that book into an opera, which is sold out. And so you can see how in Minnesota there's some very powerful stories of people uh, celebrating and leveraging the cultural assets to do things. And in this presentation, I want to offer a vision of Minnesota as a global cultural destination. Um, when you see uh, um, cultural destinations is rooted in cultural assets, and what do I mean by cultural assets? Uh, I have on the screen. Uh, these different elements of what would, con uh, would constitute these cultural assets it would be food and art and craft and music, and they are translated into cultural malls and festivals like Little Africa, Little Africa Fest. And these are things that can be a very powerful force to create what is called a cultural destination. So a cultural destination is a place, a business, or an organization that's infused with cultural assets, and they offer a very unique experience to the visitor. And it, in the process, it builds the owner 
the wealth of the owner, but also does what is called cultural placemaking. And I know uh, Chair uh, Hoffman here is a connoisseur of cultural destinations and has been to many of them, including the one that is on this picture, and can tell you about the power of this. Uh, uh, of this. And these cultural destinations are not just a concept. They can be a wealth-generating tool, not only for the owner, but also for the communities that they live in. For instance, um, in this research on cultural heritage tourism, they find that people who come with cultural heritage tourism spend more money, 60% more than others. They, it's good for the local economy. It's in the US uh, an estimate uh, some years ago about $171 billion market. But it also puts Minnesota on that global map as a place where you can find this unique destination. Two summers ago, my wife and I had drove through Minnesota visiting these cultural destinations, and some of them are out here in the next two slides. And uh, we did a video that you can see also on the website I'll share later. And some of the samples of the cities that you see, uh, and the things that caught my eye the most were a lot of these Mexican restaurants, they integrate art and culture in a very, very uh, integral way. I particularly like El Tequila in Baxter and Fiesta Me Mexicana in uh, Red Wing, uh, where you can see uh, the investment of art into that building, as well as you can hear the music and you can experience the food. Uh, here in the metro area, the Friendship Garden that uh, Chair uh, Fang He has been a champion of is a base of two other attractions on Payne Avenue. Uh, you can move and nearby find uh, Mung Village and and then other attractions on Payne and Arcade Avenue. At the African restaurant in St. Paul called Bole, the uh, owner proudly says, I want you to experience my culture. And you go in there and you experience that culture. So what can policymakers do? Um, and from my experience in the city of St. Paul, I was the director of planning and economic development for the city of St. Paul. We implemented this concept of cultural destinations across Minnesota. Uh, here on my website, I offer uh, these different tours that I've showed uh, on uh, a little while ago, uh, not only about cultural malls, but cultural museums and uh, cultural businesses uh, all across Minnesota where people can actually take a virtual tour of these uh, or drive there because there are driving directions to go there. So cultural destinations in, gets translated into these various forms that you can see up here. It could be a food truck festival like we had on Selby Avenue, uh, organized by an African-American entrepreneur, where you could see food trucks celebrating African-American uh, cuisine. Uh, you could see a place like that restaurant, El Galgal, by, uh, on the way to the airport, where an event was, uh, was hosted with, with artists. And these artists and community members engaged uh, in this coffee drinking ceremony too, uh, tr uh, tasting traditional Ethiopian coffee. Uh, you may have gone to the Mekong night, Little Mekong Night Market where you didn't have to go to Bangkok to experience the vitality and the environment of that night market. Uh, and then uh, during COVID, we, um, we organized the Taste of the World Tour where people could go and, and experience the food of different uh, cultures um, and, and, and grow their market. And I also have an experience of how, an example of how uh, cultural assets can influence real estate development. And this is the Andy Young Center on University Avenue. You have the Brownstone Building. And the east side, you have the Parkway Apartments, where cultural assets are fueling also real estate development. So why is all of this important? Uh, you may have heard uh, from uh, Mark Ritchie as he's trying to build, bring the World Expo to Minnesota. Um, you, um, uh, why, why such a thing is uh, important, I'll get to get later, but I just wanted to share uh, what policymakers can do. So on this slide, uh, policymakers uh, like this committee can help establish that cultural destination platform. So the last couple of sessions, I've heard a number of proposals from different community groups around art, around music, around logistics, around marketing, around events, around space. And uh, this committee can help finance and fund and support uh, the, this cultural destination platform all across Minnesota. So coming back to uh, Mark Ritchie and his uh, attempt to bring the World Expo to Minnesota, that's a 
big uh, attempt, but it will be tr very dramatic for Minnesota. And he uh, probably shared with you the powerful role that African immigrants here are helping him. In fact, I just saw a note from him that a group of African immigrants are in Paris lobbying the African head of states to help bring the cultural destination to here. And it's a very powerful and inspiring story. I hosted top level officials from Nigeria for leadership seminars at Concordia University. One of the first questions they asked me was, where can we get Nigerian food? Where can we find jollof rice and fufu? And yeah, we can find them in Brooklyn Park and Brooklyn Center and, uh, and so uh, our challenge as we move forward, as the world comes to here, is where can we find, can we offer the world every cuisine, every experience for every country of the world? And I think we can do with support for you. So when they come to Minnesota, they not only visit the Swedish Institute or the Celtic, uh, 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 Irish Celtic Junction or the Finnish or the Sami Museum, they'll also experience the diverse cultures at the Friendship Garden, the African American Museum, the Hmong Cultural Center, Clues Gallery, Millax Museum, the Somali and Cam Cambodian Museums, as well as the various Hmong, Latino, and African cultural malls and businesses all across Minnesota. Minnesota is an emerging cult global cultural destination, and it can be one that would be uh, a million lights shining all across Minnesota. So I have a suggestion uh, in this and other committees is uh, if this session um, if we could have small matching grants up to $5,000 that a business can take and with artists and with art organizations create these cultural destinations. Just an ethnic restaurant by itself is not a cultural destination. There has to be the murals on the wall. There has to be the music. There has to be the story. There has to be the signage. And this committee can play a big role in making that happen. So there's a concept build I have and I hope that uh, at the end of this session, we, uh, this committee and this legislature can help make Minnesota a global cultural destination. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bruce Corey. Any questions from members? Uh, Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Doc, as I was looking at the, the pictures, my, you know, years ago, Senator Fong, when we did the Midway Chamber, it, the destinations of, you could name, name a country and, and that food you can find on University Avenue. Do you remember we put that book together and you and uh, Chris Ferguson and um, all the restaurants, you know, just in that, and that the cultural, and when you mentioned Bully, you know, Solomon, who actually uh, was from Brooklyn Park, right? And then it reminds me the the connection you did between Brooklyn Park and the Midway. Yep. You know, that was one, another year study. You called that Little Africa. You know, it was just this, there's a connection there and there's a hub and it's really, I'm smiling as I'm watching you put this together because it's just, it's absolutely wonderful to see the, the historical relevance there. The, you know, what are the characteristics of not just the food, but do you know the meaning behind, you know, when you and I will have uh, the best coffee in the world, as I say, right? There's a historical meaning behind that in how you serve it and drink it, right? And it's just kind of, uh, it's a treat. It really is. And it's just, uh, it's a, it feels good. And it's what Minnesota's about, right? Um, and so, and I, I like the fact, yeah, we, here we go. You can go find, where's the, where's the place you can find the, the, the best Norwegian tea that you're going to, right? Um, discover that. Discover Minnesota. This is absolutely cool. I like this global cultural destination and it's all the work you've done for years. It's kind of night capsulized. And so uh, thank you for doing that. And I just want to know, how come you didn't have Brooklyn Park on one of your, on one of your pieces? But I, I, I get that. So thank you very much for this. And, and Senator, Mr. Chair, this is, uh, this is, it's good. So thank you. I appreciate this. Thank you. Thank Sarah you, Dr. Hoffman. Corey. Thank you, Senator Hoffman. And, uh, while listening to your presentation, uh, two ideas sparked into my mind. Uh, one would be to uh, relay the information to my cultural community to be in touch with their home country, mm -hmm. to encourage them to come to, work, to the World Expo. That would be a great idea. You know, um, the other part would be, um, and and it's not it's not an idea that you know I would would like the, uh, people to do, but just a thought. When you mentioned about cultural destination, I thought about uh, the Peanuts Gang, you know, where they have all the Charlie Browns, Linus, uh, Lucy statue, um, too many places we could do more and 
put that mm-hmm. as a, um, you know, one of those uh, Pokemon thing where you look for a character. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that that may be some good idea. But thank you for your presentation. Any 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 remark? Uh, closing yeah. remarks, uh, Dr. Corey. Uh, Chair Hall and uh, Senator um, Hoffman, I just wanted to make a couple of uh, follow-up remarks to Senator Hoffman's uh, uh, observations about uh, what uh, you're right about. I wanted to first touch on Brooklyn, the Brooklyns. I was I just gave a presentation to uh, Acer and Ma- Mayor Graves was there uh, just two days ago, uh, talking about the the immense potential that the Brooklyns offer. Minnesota. We tend to see Minneapolis, St. Paul, but there you can go there and you can see the, these cultural destinations all over that have not been celebrated enough and to how to pull them together into a beautiful um, uh, vision like a cultural tour and I'm glad people uh, out there are thinking seriously about it and yes, um, they, it's part of what I'd like to, uh, uh, to develop in the future. But also, I'd like to thank you for pointing out the uh, importance of this concept and, and you being a champion in the legislature of, and even Senator uh, Chair Hong, uh, Fong Ho over the past decades uh, has been a constant voice in this committee uh, celebrating the cultural assets of people. And finally, I think the time has come and the opportunity has come in the World Expo to let everything, to bring all our talents and, and as you could see in what's happening with the people who are helping Mark Ritchie and his team bring the World Expo here. It's such a remarkable story. And so I thank you for, uh, and your idea about uh, the peanut statue and how we could uh, uh, build uh, that brand identity and that, that connection to people uh, through, through these kinds of mechanisms. So, like that slide says that the, the map, a stamp of Minnesota on the map, let's make Minnesota that global destination that everybody will want to come. And when they come, they stay longer, spend more, build wealth, especially in our low income diverse co- communities. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testify and presentation. So, um, do we have quorum? Um, sure. Okay, Senator Hoffman, you ready for yours? Sure. Okay. And, and uh, Senator Strong, so, sorry, sorry to ask you to hold on for a little while because we want to get a little quorum. Which one, one member is short. Welcome, Senator Hoffman. Anytime you're ready. Senator Hurd, thank you. That was a great presentation. And we want to give you another one where this is really uh, something of importance. And, and Senate File 3052, really, when you look at the Minnesota Council on Disability, it was founded in 1973 by the legislature. And it's an independent state agency that advocates for all Minnesotans with disabilities. There's a cross section, intersectionality that occurs. They're really helping agencies and, and folks understand. What does accessibility mean? What does intentional mean? What does purposeful mean, right? And, and Minnesota Council on Disability serves as the policy training and technical resource for all the state legislature, governor's office, and the executive branches, right? And, and you look at it, their principles are, in, are founded in statutes, right? And if you want to get geeky, 256.482, not anybody wants to look that up right now, they can. The agency has contributed to not only our state, but the national disability landscape. This agency has been primary, all disability focused, Senator Her and its focused agency to serve Minnesotans with disabilities. It contributes to the unique national prestige of Minnesota as an agency that contributes to the passage, that absolutely materially contributed to the passage of the ADA and were instrumental in the compliance of the Rehab Act of 1973. 
the year that the council was established. The Minnesota Council on Disabilities continually plays an instrumental part, Senator Her, What we're asking for is $371,000 in the first year and $371,000 in the second year. And, and it really looks at a couple of things, arts, history, and cultural heritage. And let me point out one thing that, that they're doing that I think is really important, is they're gonna digitally archive all their records in the historical content. Just like our governors, under the DD Act federally, we also have a governor's DD council, right? And uh, Colleen Wick got to do that. Not only was it um, one of the first to do it in the nation, but she's got an international acclaim. There are thousands of, of, of hits that go to that site to look up the historical relevance of how people with disabilities were treated and, and how we still institutionally have ableism beyond. And so it's a continual fight for that, Senator Hurd. And with that, Trevor Turner, who is the council's public policy director, and Honorable Nikki Villavencicio, who is, uh, she's the chairperson, chairwoman of the of the council. And then Linda Gremlin, Gremlin I can't pronounce any words today. Sorry, Linda. Um, she's here if you got any questions for her, but I'll just turn it over to uh, Nikki and Trevor. So thank you. Sure. And let, let a note in the record now that we have quorum. So uh, uh, go ahead, uh, Mr. Turner. Thank you, Chair Her, and thank you, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Trevor Turner, and I'm the Public Policy Director for the Minnesota Council on Disability. Um, I'd like to thank Senator Hoffman for authoring Senate File 3052, and thank you, Chair Her, for being its co-author. Um, you know, founded in 1973, the Minnesota Council on Disability is an independent state agency that advocates for all Minnesotans with disabilities. MCD serves as a policy training and technical resource for the state legislature, the governor's office, and executive branch agencies. And MCD's vision is guided by the principles of accessibility, equity, and independence, as well as our founding statute, which includes serving as a resource and source of information to the public regarding all services, program, and legislation pertaining to Minnesotans with disabilities. For the past 50 years, the Minnesota Council on Disability has been a force for change among the state and national disability landscape. MCD has contributed to the unique uh, national prestige of Minnesotans as a leader in the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act. The Minnesota Council on Disability has played and continues to play an instrumental part in improving the lives of Minnesotans with disabilities, ensuring disability access and inclusion for Minnesotan communities across the state and beyond. This year, the Minnesota Council on Disability is celebrating its 50th anniversary, an important milestone for any agency. With legacy funding, we hope to mark the occasion by digitally archiving all of our records and historical content from 50 years of disability advocacy in Minnesota. We also plan to commission and produce a 50th anniversary art poster and other commemorative media such as videos and podcasts. It is important to recognize and preserve the cultural contributions of Minnesotans with disabilities, which we hope to do with this legacy funding. It is also important for us to document and archive the stories of Minnesotans with disabilities, especially from the past 50 years, before they are gone forever. This also includes outreach to greater Minnesota and focusing on documenting the statewide story that we do not have yet. We believe that there are many folks with disabilities in greater Minnesota that have stories of resilience and disability pride, but no one is recording and archiving them. Also, as the Americans with Disabilities Act turns 33 and NCD turns 50, we are hyper aware of the limited time we have to collect and archive the stories of the thousands of disability advocates who contributed to the advancement of disability rights statewide and nationally for the past 50 years. Finally, even though it's the 50th anniversary of the establishment of the Minnesota Council on Disability, we know our partners in the disability community have much to contribute to this project. And we will engage our state agency partners, our nonprofit partners, the business community, and the public to tell the unique and important contribution of Minnesotans with disabilities through the lens of the 50th anniversary of this agency. And thank you, Chair Her, and members of the committee, and thank you for your support for Minnesotans with disabilities. Thank you, Mr. Turner. Uh, now I pass to I will pass to Ms. Ms. Valencia Sincho. Thank Go you, ahead. Chair. State your name for the record. Good morning, Chair and Committee members. My name is Nikki Villavicencio, and I am currently the Chair of the Minnesota Council on Disability. I am here to urge you to support Senate File 3052. So according to the encyclopedia.com, culture encompasses the set of beliefs, moral values, traditions, language, and rules of behavior. For centuries, people with disabilities have not only been a cultural group, but also have contributed greatly to the community as a whole. 
To some, we are the invisible culture. But the truth is, it is because we are the intersectors of all cultural groups. That's true. There are endless examples of people in the disability community that would demonstrate our culture and legacy. In Minnesota, we are fortunate to have a rich history of pillars in the community that have shaped, do shape, and will shape the disability community. And allies that have come alongside of us, creating policy that usually is above the national standards. The Minnesota Council on Disability was founded in 1973. That means the governor and the legislature have relied on MCD for 50 years. In 2022, Governor Walls proclaimed July Disability Pride Month, which acknowledges the resilience and tenacity of the disability community. This bill would allow us to reach out specifically to greater Minnesota to connect to parts of the state where some of the most isolated people are. We would be able to use technology to connect with Minnesotans in multiple ways, creating better access for and with people with disabilities, effectively making MCD a better agency for the next 50 years. Thank you so much for listening to us and supporting this bill. Um, we, stand, we sit and stand for any questions and um, comments. Thank you, uh, Ms. Villa Cicencio and uh, Mr. Turner and Senator Hoffman for your presentation. Thank you for bringing the proclamation, the copy of the proclamation from the governor as well. And hopefully this July, he will present another one and for 2023. And this um, arts and culture request matched very well with this 50 year anniversary of Minnesota Council on Disability. So uh, any question from members, uh, whether those here or online? Senator Hoffman, closing remark. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. It's important that we understand this is a legacy of, of what disability is in Minnesota. And I'm very honored to bring this bill and proud of the work that these two are doing on behalf of uh, a lot of people in Minnesota. One in four people live with a disability in Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, and thank you. I'm also honored to be a co-author of this bill as well. Thank you. So we'll lay over Senate file. 3052 for possible inclusion in the legacy omnibus bill. Okay, uh, next I call Senator Shong um, to present 25, uh, Senate File 2584, Keller Regional Park Improvement. And I also like to call uh, Mr. McCabe, not to Fang. Ku Kai Xiong, you can come. Oh, there's only okay. That's good. Um, okay, welcome, Senator Xiong. Uh, thank you, Chair and uh, Committee members. Uh, I have before you Senate File 2589, and there is a 82 amendment. Okay, um, Senator Xiong, motion. Oh, Senator Xiong, and um, uh, Senator Houshai would like to. Can you move the A2 amendment for uh, uh, Senator Shawn 2589? So moved, okay. Mr. Chair. All in favor of that amendment say aye. 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 Um, opposed, nay. Okay, motion prevail. Okay, Senator Shawn, um, <clears throat> on to your bill as amended. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, this bill um, would provide funding to help support and celebrate Hmong Cultural Heritage, uh, Hmong Minnesotan Cultural Heritage, uh, funding that would be used to redevelop the Tulu Courts at Keller Regional Park, located in Maplewood, Minnesota, as well as provide a versatile playing surface for others, uh, other games, uh, such as Sepak Takra, the game of Tulu, has been played for thousands of years and has deep cultural significance in the Hmong community. Uh, Hmong community members have uh, very few facilities to play this game, so this facility would have regional and statewide significance. Um, current facilities are deteriorating and are in need of capital investment um, 
and cultural funding to, for for play to be able to continue. Uh, in addition to celebrating a piece of Hmong culture, the redeve redevelopment of this facility would promote physical and mental fitness for players, families, and interested parties. Uh, Tulu club members are excited to teach this game to others and share this important part of their culture. Um, and I thank you, the chair, for carrying this effort in the past, and we look to hopefully continue this work going forward. Thank you, Sen Xiong. Um, Mr. McCabe, uh, please state your name for the record. Yes, I'm Mark McCabe. I'm the director of the Ramsey County Parks and Recreation Department. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members for having us here today. I'll yield most of my time to the club members who are here today to share, but I just wanted to thank you for hearing this bill um, and for the consideration, again, this, uh, the game of Tulu and to expand this field into having <clears throat> multiple uh, type of events of, of cultural significance is uh, very important to the community. We've heard uh, very f positive feedback from members of the community about uh, feeling valued and heard and, and having their culture celebrated by having this opportunity to um, participate in this game. Um, the, we've learned a lot about just the operations and, and ongoing needs for facilities like this, and so this would be a long-term investment in the facility that would set uh, the sport up for success for the long-term future, and members of the Hmong community and, and players have been very uh, adamant about wanting to share this uh, part of their culture and, and share this game with all who are interested. Um, so it's been a very positive relationship and something that we value a great deal. So want to uh, thank you again for hearing this and considering this opportunity and an opportunity to celebrate the Hmong cultural heritage um, for our residents in Ramsey County and beyond. Thank you, Mr. McCabe. Uh, Mr. Natufa. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. <clears throat> My name is Nato Vang. I'm 68 years old. <clears throat> a, a CIA secret war during the Vietnam War in Laos. Tulu is um, a Hmong heritage originated from the great grandpa and grandma, even Adam, that left us on Earth. <laughs> um, Tao Tulu is a sport that can be played with both genders, girls and boys. And it can start with the age of six or seven to as long as that person can play. Um, <clears throat> during our Hmong culture, sport is Tulu, tossball, and race horse very fast, but there's no choice here, but Tulu left along with us. Um, I believe that Tulu is one thing can help us. I am 60 years old. I'm still healthy because of Tulu. <laughs> uh, we need to have that part to improve, to get, get better. Uh, place for us, for the community to get access to. For example, uh, play, playing ground for the kids when we play right there, and um, bathroom too. Uh, also, it's good for the elder to play, uh, to keep their, maintain their health on a daily basis. And, and to know it's good for the kids after school for crime prevention also. Uh, the part can be used for just, the court can, not just for use to look, it can be used for other purposes as well. So, <clears throat> today, our Hmong population is growing day by day, and this Tulu court needs to improve for, to reach the standard of the part facilities. Um, I believe this court will bring uh, will be improved to meet the needs of 
our community, and and I hope the Senate, the committee, will pass this bill. Thank you, Mr. To greater no. our community. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nato Xiong, and uh, look, Senator. Uh, thank you, you Chair. Have, yep. uh, just wanted to add. Um, so what, what is Tulu? So it's a top spinning game. Uh, Senator Hoffman is pretty familiar with this, but don't be near him when he throws the uh, ball. So uh, we, uh, being a newer member to this body, I didn't know if we could bring uh, props, but uh, it's, a, it's a top spinning game where uh, gentlemen, uh, men, would line up, men and women would line up to throw a spinning top that's pretty heavy uh, at a target and trying to knock out each other's top. And so I welcome you to join me in my district and we can hold another uh, grand opening for this and uh, take turns with the top spinning game. And so. Sir, our members, you. you can come to my office. I have two in there. <laughs> like, um, did, you, did you have someone that we'll bring today and running we later? Have, we have the, we have the two here we can spin. Oh, well, why don't you demonstrate? <laughs> <laughs> yes, he was at yeah, SGU. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. This is make, used to make up wood, but since wood is hard to make, it's custom made. It's make up plastic. It's put a metal in here so it mm -hmm. can spin on the ground. Then without worn out, keep it for a long time. And the stick, it's a, uh, used to, we used to use for uh, a wood or bamboo. Okay, Mr. Shong, if you can move a little bit to the center so the camera can yeah. catch you. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's it. All yes, right. and uh, it's a uh, very, has a lot of cultural significance and, and he. Today is very, uh, <laughs> very easy. We can use golf, stick, and cut off, and cut off. <laughs> <laughs> reuse, reuse, and reduce. Yeah. And then, You do from how, how, how far distant? Um, the distance is we have a total of eight bases. Base one to base eight. Last base is 70 feet. Okay. Yeah, it will spend a long time. Yeah. Oh, then, Chair, we have a, a number of letters of support from the community, also for the uh, committee members, and uh, we hope that we could get. Uh, everyone's support for this bill. Thank you. Yeah, and then, uh, just for the record, uh, you, you, we had the letter in front of you uh, from Mong Town Marketplace, uh, Mr. Tuo Xiong, and from uh, Rainbow Home Healthcare, uh, from Mr. Vong Lao, and Mong American Partnership, um, as well as the United Hmong Family, so 18 Clan Council. As well, so those are to name a few. Any question? Uh, you still have one more testifier, Ku Kai Xiong. Is he here? Um, I think he he had uh, another engagement okay. that he had to go to. Okay. Any question from members? Mr. Chair, I just, if I may, I just uh, thank you. I didn't mention Mr. Vang and said STU, and I just wanted to say thank you for uh, his service that uh, during that time. So right. Um, yeah. Uh, for that, I, I, I really honor Mr. Xiong for being here and your service to our country, too, during the Secret War in Laos. And if you say you're 60, you must be recruited as a young age. You know, so thank you for your service. And also display a fun game. You know, struggle there, sat there, but we're happy here with the game. Yeah, so, um, any final remark? Any question from members online? Or... Okay, any anybody from the audience? If not, uh, closing remarks, uh, Senator uh, I hope to get your support on this uh, bill to 
help fund this uh, culture activity. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you. So we'll lay uh, you, Senate file 2586 as amended for possible inclusion in the legacy omnibus bill. Thank you all for coming. Okay. Senator House Chow, Joel Core Library, uh, Senate File 2769. Anytime you're ready, uh, it, Senator House Chow. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Uh, this is Senate File 2769, a bill to appropriate uh, a drill appropriation for the Drill Core Library. Uh, the Drill Core Library is in Hibbing, uh, up on the Iron Range, and is the single location for Minnesota for archiving statewide core samples. The library attracts mineral exploration staff and researchers from around the world looking for new mineral deposits and conducting various research projects. IT, IT is open to the public during business hours and viewing the facility and core is free. However, acting on the feedback from safety inspections, the DNR had to shut down access to the library to the public and staff starting in June of 2022. The steel structure systems are visibly showing strain and some of the systems are over 50 years old that don't meet modern safety standards. The DNR is asking for $1 million to address these safety concerns and reopen the library to the public. And with that, I do have a testifier, Joe Henderson, the, uh, with the DNR Lands and Mineral Division. Mr. Henderson, please state your name for the record. Again, my name is Joe Henderson. I'm the Division Director for the Division of Lands and Minerals at the Minnesota DNR. So repeating a couple points from Senator Housechild, again, the Drill Corps Library in Hibbing, Minnesota, is the single location in the state of Minnesota for archiving statewide core samples. A drill core is a core of a hollow drill pipe, which is a sample of the mineralogy in the path for drilling. The Drill Core Library was initially established to drive mining, mineral, and mineralogy uh, related investment in northeastern Minnesota and support environmental research for state, federal, and private parties, as well as academia. The amount of core within the library continues to grow based on current state law that requires exploration companies to submit at least a quarter core for any exploration drill hole. The facility has played a critical role in attracting more than $600 million in geoscience research and investment into Minnesota over the past 20 years. The Drill Corps Library atta attracts mineral exploration staff and researchers from around the world looking for new mineral deposits or conducting various research projects. State law does require that the building is open to the public during business hours and viewing at the facility is free. Three storage buildings comprise the facility, which have steel structural systems bolted to the floor for storing a total capacity of 4 million linear feet of core. Acting on feedback from a safety inspection, the DNR did shut down the access to the Drill Corps Library and the public staff in June 2022. The steel structural systems in various portions of the Drill Corps Library are visibly showing strain, whereas other storage structural systems are over 50 years old and do not meet modern safety standards. We have been told that they are at risk of collapse. Collapse of the steel structures pose a risk for damaging and collapsing the outer shell of the buildings. The DNR is asking for a million dollars to address the safety concerns and reopen the drill core library. Handling drill core is labor intensive. Retrieving and moving core is done by hand because of the way the facilities were designed. Therefore, stocking and restocking must be done in a box by box basis. Core may need to be reboxed and to be safely moved. It's estimated that there are as many as 90,000 boxes weighing an average of 15 to 45 pounds per box that will need to be taken off the steel structure systems, moved, stored, the systems will be replaced, and then the box would be replaced within the same building, and they must be in exactly the same sequential order. So, the intended result of this full request is to safely replace the storage structure systems where they need to be and to reopen the drill core library as a safe working environment as soon as possible without any loss of drill core. Thank you for your time. 
Uh, thank, thank, you, thank you very much, Mr. Henderson. Um, I visit uh, the northern area, like to Ely and to Hibbing and um, even to Tower. Um, and uh, the drill core library actually one and more memorable, even though it's stagnant. You know, like you can see that the I, I'm fascinated by seeing the line of core and see different layer of age and how you know how it is coming to the modern day. So that did uh, um, yeah that did inspire me in in many way and out of curiosity and and so forth. So thank you for bringing this bill forward. Any questions from members and the members online? Okay. Senator uh, Green has a um, has a question. He raises his hand. Senator Green, can Thank you, you turn? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yep. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, I just had a question. Uh, how many? Uh, excuse me. How many visitors a year uh, visit the library? Uh, Senator House Chow or uh, Mr. Henderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Green. I'm going to defer to Mr. Henderson. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Senator Green, I don't have the exact numbers. I can get some of those for you. I do know how many we have turned down in the last year when we haven't been open. I have those specific numbers in front of me. And it's, it's visitors, again, this cuts across academia, research, industry, and, and tours from colleges and other areas. So what I can tell you in the last, in, in, uh, actually, I'm sorry, just in the last three months, let's go in the last three months, we had to deny one request to receive core uh, from six different companies. So companies wanted to, to come and, and uh, drop their core off with us. We can't let them in. We can't receive their core. So that was six different companies just in the last three months. Um, two different companies wanted to come and examine core. Um, five different international organizations wanted to come and visit the core library and there was three different tours that had to be canceled including a field trip associated with a national conference for the American Society of Reclamation Sciences and and Senator Green that's the last three months Senator Green any follow-up yeah I well maybe I could just talk I'm just interested in this because I'm, I'm thinking this doesn't really seem like it's as much of a of a walk-in type thing as it is for uh, more of a people that are looking for uh, for core samples for other uh, other businesses, different uh, projects or whatever. And, and so that that's what as I'm listening to this, it wasn't really clear because if uh, if the majority of the people that are coming in are wanting you to do sampling. Is that, is that what it is on, on their cores? Uh, Mr. Henderson. Chair, Senator Green, typically that is not the case. Um, typically if someone is doing exploration, they will keep their core on their site because of course they want to not have their core necessarily be public for everyone to view and to understand what is in it. However, state law requires when their leases or their exploration activities, the term is up on that, that is when the state statute requires them to submit at least a quarter core to the state. So there's many people that you can imagine that have been uh, doing exploration with state leases or private leases for decades that have their own core. There are other private core facilities, but at the end of the time in which their leases run up or, or their, their project uh, no longer is, is um, being sought by them, they must return that core to us. So more frequently uh, than companies looking at their own core, it's uh, academia or companies from totally outside of Minnesota that maybe don't have leases but are exploring potential uh, activities in the future in Minnesota and coming to look at the core to see if they can target the critical minerals or the other things that they may want to come to explore. Or on the other side of that, it's academia or others looking to uh, get out in front of environmental issues and what better way to than, than actually have the actual core from hundreds of feet down in the earth that you would potentially seek to mine someday and actually use that exact geology to uh, understand what the uh, potential water and other issues could be if you were to ever mine that. Okay. Um. Thank you. Thank you both. Any further discussion? Uh, Senator Hao Chow, closing. Uh, Senator Lane, you have one? No, no I was okay. Senator Hao Chow, closing comment. 
Thank you, Chair Her um, and members of the committee. Uh, I think this is really, really critical that we fund this project. It's been on the DNR's priority list. Um, I don't want to see the structural um, you know, infrastructure of this facility crumble to the point where you know, it's unmanageable. So uh, hopefully we can get this funding, get this back up, and, and serve the region. Thank you. Thank you, Senator House Child. So now we, um, <clears throat> we're going to motion and we're going to move uh, Senate File uh, 2769 to be recommended to be referred to the Finance Committee. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Okay. Aye. Uh, aye. Opposed? Nay. Okay. Motion prevail. So Senate File 2769 is uh, yep. traveling to Finance Committee. Thank you. Senator House Child. Now it's, next is my bill. <clears throat> I'll, I'll let, I'll let uh, Senator Hoffman, you want to take the gavel from me? I will, Senator Fer Hon Fong Her. Do you um, also, you had Senator How you were going to wait for uh, um, enough people to be able to do. We already moved that. Oh, Did yes. he wanted to, let's, we were going to dual track it for Senator let's, let's, let's How. Do, do you want to right do now. that real quick, Senator? Okay. Okay. Yeah, what did you want, you want a motion? Uh, yeah, Senator, Senator Fong, her, I, I, uh, Mr. Chair, I, I, I make a, a motion that we take Senate file 0136 um, to be uh, re-referred on general orders. Is that No, we're not. No, we're going to finance. Re-referred, passed, and sent to finance. Thank you. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Nay. Okay, motion prevail. Senator Herr, welcome to your committee. Isn't that great to say that? Welcome to your committee, Senator Herr. You have Senate File 1898, and it looks like the folks are passing out an A3 amendment. I suppose is that also available online? Um, yes. Senator Herr, to your amendment. It's your first stop, right, Senator? Uh, yes, Senator Hoffman, thank you. Um, let me uh, pull out my introduction first. <clears throat> and uh, I also like to call my testifier, uh, Ms. B. Bang Mo and Dr. Li Pao Xiong, to come to the uh, presentation table. Come on up, and then uh, uh, Senator, Fur <laughs> move, Senator Fong Her moves the A3 amendment. Yep. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Senator Herr, the bill is yours. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Chair Hoffman and members. I'm honored to present I'm honored to present to you something that's near and dear to me. I thank each one of you for your service to this country and our state, despite the different views and representation. Members, I am a proud American but my cultural identity as a Hmong person is disappearing quicker than I know, or we know. Today I'm asking you, the Senate member, to help us preserve. Despite not having a country of identity, Hmong is a 5,000 years old culture from China to Laos, living isolated from civilization until the Vietnam War. Our culture transformed from, from a grand society to the aerospace era within 15 years. Hmong may seem to adapt well to America, but lost more than we know in terms of heritage, language, and culture. Many attribute factors that erode, that, uh, to the erosion of Hmong language and culture are due to displacement, disparities, and diaspora. As chair of the Environment, Climate, and Legacy Committee, I can at least do my part to preserve the endangered language culture and heritage of my people. 
I ask you to join me in support of this legislation, Senate File 1898, uh, to direct fund to Minnesota Humanity Center to record, document, and preserve the Hmong language, culture, and heritage. Although I stated in the introduction as a first person, the Hmong cultural preservation is not about me, nor for me, but instead for the benefit of Minnesota and the cultural fabric of our state and America. Thank you for your support. And I have two testify here uh, with me. Uh, we can start with Ms. Moore. Bivang Mua, so we wanted to say your name for the record, please. Hello, my name is Bivang Moore. I am the director of the Hmong program at the University of Minnesota as part of the Asian and Middle Eastern Studies Pro, uh, Department. Thank you so much, uh, committee members, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I am here to attest to the urgency of necessary Hmong language and culture preservation. Exactly 10 years ago, April 2013, I was requested to do a presentation on language preservation at the Hmong National uh, Development Conference. And I talked about the death of a language. I talked about the gradual loss of uh, language and culture, ultimately resulting in the death of a language and death of culture. And dying, uh, language dying is when uh, community members of, of that particular culture no longer use it for everyday um, interpersonal communication, but only for very specific cultural um, <laughs> events. And that is where we are today. Majority of our students, majority of our uh, Hmong children no longer speak or speak very limited Hmong. And here we see the current process of the ultimate death of a language. There are no quantitative data of these students, but in my 17 years of leading Hmong language and culture program at the university, um, it is with my professional assessment that this has been happening, and today we are at the crossroads. Exactly 10 years later today, the same question and the same topic is still being discussed without the support. But the level of urgency is very different today. We're at the momentum of taking that crossroad. In only 10 years, there is now a very palpable fear of what is going to happen in the coming 10 to 15 years. We're no longer questioning how to preserve, but instead we're living the actual process of loss. Just last year, the Hmong Teachers Coalition had a retreat and the host was very surprised at what this retreat was all about and shared with us that only 10 to 15 years ago, her own mother was working with teachers on how to teach Hmong children to understand English. And now these Hmong, this Hmong language coalition was working together on how to help Hmong children to preserve and understand Hmong. And this is in the short time span of about 10 to 15 years. What does loss of language mean for Hmong identity? Hmong is a long practice of oral traditions. Loss of language means loss of cultural practices, history, traditions, meaningful expressions, family lineages, and more. And what does it mean to the larger community? It means a loss of 5,000 years of critical knowledge indigenous to many regions in ancient spaces and places. It is the loss of yet another indigenous language as we have seen of our First Nations here in the United States, especially in Minnesota as well. Hmong language has only the current um, the current system of the RPA has only been established since the early 1950s. We have yet to have enough written information down and we need all the support that we can get resources in order to take down this information before all of our elders are gone. An example of Grandpa Tso Miava, who has just recently passed, who was a living ledger of all Hmong language, culture, and heritage that we can no longer utilize as a resource. Without the knowledge of our elders, the only thing that Hmong children can do is learn about themselves from the notations and observations of non-Hmong individuals, very specifically having to learn how to read French or Mandarin in order to understand about Hmong. You and I, we are tomorrow's ancestors. Today, we are at the crossroad of a very pivotal mov movement. You and I will either become those who lead the process of loss of Hmong language or who were uh, existing then, or we will become those who partook in to revive, reclaim, and champion the preservation and survival of this language. I, for one, choose to fight, and I hope that this committee will also champion the critical work to preserve today's waning Hmong language with me and with other passionate advocates as well. Thank you, committee members. Watch out, Ms. Mao. Um, thank you for that. It, it's interesting, Senator Her, on the, you have a relative who's, younger children came home and announced how I, we were in the same room and that they no longer wanted to speak Hmong 
at home, right? And that, to your point, that's the their third generation, and it just I, it just dawned on me. So, thank you for that, so, uh, Senator Her, Dr. Li Pao Zhang. Mr. Chair and members of the committee, uh, thank you for allowing me to uh, be here. Uh, my name is Li Pao Xiong, the director of the Center for Hmong Studies at Concordia University, St. Paul. I am here to testify in support of Senate File 1898. I want to also toss in <clears throat> the comment made by uh, Dr. Bruce Corey on his presentation earlier. A couple of years ago, Air America, which is the CIA uh, proxy airline in Laos, they had, their, they had their reunion in Minnesota because of the Hmong. Uh, in September, uh, we will have the uh, Thailand, Laos, and Cambodian Brotherhood. They will have the reunion in Minnesota because of the Hmong as well. And these are members from throughout the world coming here, people that worked with us during the Secret World of Laos. And anyways, uh, why is it important that we collect, preserve, and study, and share history and culture? According to AK, uh, Dia Publishing, history and culture helps us develop better understanding of the world. Understanding history and culture help us understand the world at large. History and culture help us understand ourselves. To understand who we are, you need to develop a sense of self. Studying history at large can help us understand our personal history. History help us to understand other people. History and culture teaches a working understanding of change. And history and culture help us be decent citizens. When we started the Center for Hmong Studies in 2004, um, some of the manufacturer asked, what are you doing? I said, we're creating better Americans. <laughs> Unfortunately, being an oral culture with a written uh, language only created in the 1950s by missionaries, a linguist from Bethel University right here in Minnesota, there's a need for institutions to work to collect, preserve, and disseminate historical and cultural artifacts as well as uh, historical documents relating to the Hmong experiences. Funding as proposed will afford institutions like ours, the Center for Hmong Studies, the opportunity to continue to expand our work. Over the years, I've been the, as, uh, as the director of the Center for Hmong Studies, we've received millions of documents, historical documents, artifacts, uh, photographs relating to the Hmong people. Uh, but the capacity to receive and process these historical documents and artifacts requires resources. And as such, I urge you to support this particular bill. It's always a joy uh, to read the uh, faculty evaluation at the end of the semester from my students who are Hmong. And these are Hmong students. <laughs> and to have them write to say, wow, I never heard, I never learned about this. I never learned about my history, my culture because it was never taught in the schools. And so, uh, and also to have them come to visit the center and to say, wow, you know, we have such a his rich history. Um, and so, unfortunately, many of the people who carry these histories are dying. And many of the people who are policy witness for us during the war have also passed on. For example, John Wong Pao, Colonel Belair, to many other individuals, many of the SGU members. And they take with them their history and, and artifacts and documents. And so if we don't preserve my generations, we'll be the generation to collect this because we know who's who. And uh, so if we don't have these documents, we will only have folk tales to tell, not history to tell. So I urge you to support uh, this legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, going to members, uh, any questions? Senator Fong Her, to your bill and, and to the um, uh, members that you had and, and to the testifiers that you had. Yeah, I appreciate Dr. Li Pao Xiong and Ms. B. Bang Moore here to, uh, for the testimony. And uh, again, I'm, you know, Hmong is my pride and dignity as an American. And I will defend the same essence of this freedom for others. You know, like, um, like on the dollar bill, say, a permanent bus unum. Out of many, we are one. Out of many culture, we are one United States. And so uh, thank you for the opportunity to present this bill and ask for your support and uh, ask for you to uh, lay over as amended um, for possible inclusion in the legacy bill. 
Thank you, Senator Hurd. Sounds like that's what we're going to do with this. Lay it over. What chow? What chow, Senator Hoffman? Van Lee Hur. Well done. Yes. And uh, we need to walk down to the front of the Capitol and, and uh, reminisce about when that was just a blank piece of land right. property right. and. Now to see the storyline that's that's there, Senator Fonger, you and I were freshmen. Yes, remember. So this this is good. This is joyful. Thank you, Senator Fonger. Senate File Twenty One Fourteen. So uh, thank you. Uh, the next bill is. Uh, Senate File 2114. And this bill um, <clears throat> has two purposes into one. The first purpose is uh, it uh, required reports, a guardrail for our legacy dollars, uh, money that we will be spent for Arts and Culture Heritage Fund, uh, so that uh, there's accountability. And you know, you can look at the bill language. It specifies five items of, of accountability. But this bill is also served as um, a vehicle. Once we pass this, it will go to the floor service vehicle for possibly legacy omnibus bill. So, remember, I can stand for question, uh, or we could just quickly lay this. Is it lay this bill? Um, uh, I want to ask council: Is it lay this bill, or just send it to the floor? My notes say, send it to the floor. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Chair, you could send this separately. Uh, it doesn't have a, it doesn't need to go to finance, or you could include it in the legacy bill or both. How's that for uh, too many I, choices? I think uh, to take the third choice that cover both. That cover both. <laughs> <laughs> so if you, uh, Senator Hur, I think if we, um, if we send it to the floor on general orders, we can also keep it here. Isn't that correct? So it's, you, you do what Senator Howe did, what you allowed, what we did with Senator Howe's bill. Dual we track. gave him a dual track on this, right? So is it your, is it your then, um, is, it, is it your wish to uh, go ahead and, and pass this bill uh, and, and send it on general orders? Refer it to general orders. Refer it to a general order. Yes. Senator Fong, her uh, moves that Senate file 2114 be passed and referred to general orders. Is that correct? All those in members say aye. 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 Opposed? Same sign. Senator Her, you're going to the floor. Okay, well, thank you. And thank you, members, uh, for some of that are here and uh, some that are online to, uh, for this committee. Uh, Cara, our community, community administrator, do you have any update for next week? Um, sure. Uh, the uh, tentative plan is to roll out the Environment Budget Omnibus Bill next week. So Tuesday, um, we would do the walkthrough, and then Thursday would mark up the bill. So, and we will post a um, delete all amendment online as soon as it's available. Okay. And from now till then, or even next week, I want to, you know, I'm available for members. If there's any uh, requests you know, in the nick of time, I will try to do, do the, we or I will try to do the best I can, but uh, I will be available for, mainly for our members here. So uh, thank you with that. Um, so the Senator, do you have a question, Senator, Senator like, Ling? I didn't, but I was just like, what, what do you mean, Senator? Do we have, can I drop a couple bills? <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> yeah. I will be open for, for, my office will be open. We'll, we'll, we'll talk. We'll talk. Yes. Wait, I got a couple more. Wait, if you're, I'm kidding. I just, we're just, I'm just, I just want you. to make myself available. Available. That's what, yeah. see, okay, that's Senator that. Lang, you made it very clear, available. So <laughs> the notice, I will make myself available for members that want to have discussion on, <laughs> on policy or, you know, um, our omnibus bill. So thank you all. Uh, it's been a good Friday um, and happy Friday to everyone. So meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Yeah.